there's one great contrast between an airplane and every other form of locomotion and transportation. I mean, think of it. Bicycle, car, tractor, truck, train, even a large battleship. They can all come to a stop and not endanger themselves. In fact, they even have the possibility of reversing and not endangering themselves. But if an airplane is flying along and comes to a stop, there's a problem. If I'm on an airplane and I hear the engines cut, I think I would start to be concerned a little. Not that I can do anything about it, but I would be concerned a little. You see, the airplane must be going forward and even up in order to be in a safe zone. Well, you know, it's like that for us as Christians and like that for us as a church. The only safe motion for us is to go forward and upward. And if we stop or begin to stop or start to go backward, at that moment, we are in danger. I remember a milk carton that I used to stare at in the breakfast in the morning. And on that milk carton, it had this caption. It had a, a picture on it with a stork carrying in the sling, not a baby, but carrying a bone. And it said, your bones are living. They renew themselves just about every seven years. Calcium is a factor in the development and maintenance of bones and teeth. Every day, give the job to milk. Well, the analogy of the human body to describe the church of Jesus Christ is no mistake. Just as the body must be constantly renewing and growing, like renewing the bones is a kind of growth, so the body of Jesus Christ must be constantly growing. If your bones cease to grow, cease the renewal process, you're in trouble. If any organism ceases to grow, then it's starting to die. And if the body of Jesus Christ ceases to grow, it begins to die. Well, the first church that we we'll read about in the book of Acts, especially in Acts 2, 42 to 47, was a church on the growing edge. Acts 2, 42 to 47, it's one of those summary passages in the book of Acts. Here's a church that's on the growing edge. And as we look at this passage, we will see the marks, the characteristics of a growing church. And churches throughout the centuries have looked at this passage and compared it to themselves to say, are we a growing church? So as we consider this passage, let's ask ourselves, are we on the growing edge? In what way are we on the growing edge? We, West Village Church, how is God calling us to be on the growing edge are the characteristics of this first church in this summary passage the characteristics of our church? And so as we approach this passage, Acts 2, 42 to 47, we're going to be asking this question, what does it look like to be on the growing edge? Acts chapter 2, beginning at 42. If you have your Bible, I invite you to take your Bible out and look at it. If you read your Bible on your device, you can read it on your device. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Here ends this reading of the word of God. Amen. What does it look like to be on the growing edge? Well, first, the early church was on the growing edge with devotion. Verse 42, the first characteristic that we notice in this passage is devotion. Carol Fraser, as a teenager of age 17, was a girl devoted to the late Elvis Presley, who died in 1997, 1977. After much effort, she managed to get a street in her town changed in honor of Elvis Presley. 
Miss Fraser was so excited she didn't know what to do. Probably watch another Elvis movie, but she'd already watched all of them so many times. Well, Carol moved from New Orleans to be near Elvis, and she moved into a tiny Memphis flat with her mother, 12 scrapbooks about Elvis, 40,000 pictures of Elvis, a man-sized cardboard replica of Elvis overlooking her bed. Yikes. Carol Fraser is devoted to Elvis Presley. In fact, you might say she's a little crazy about him, a fanatic. Are you devoted? Do you run the risk of being called a little crazy, a fanatic? Acts 2.42 says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. They devoted themselves. They were devoted. Well, a definition of devotion is to apply time, attention, yourself completely to some activity. It means you dedicate yourself. I want you to note that devoted is what we call a transitive verb. It doesn't stand alone. It demands an object. You must be devoted to someone or something. You can't be just devoted, period. You're devoted to someone or something. Devotion doesn't exist in and of itself. It is directed towards someone or something else. What is of great importance in this passage is that to which they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and prayer. So first, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Well, the apostles' teaching was based on the Word of God, and the Word of God for them at that time was the Old Testament as we know it. There was no New Testament yet. However, the apostles' teaching was authoritative because it was teaching that the Lord was communicating through the apostles. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit and what they were saying. And their their teaching was meant to be applied to individual lives. The teaching wasn't the kind you just carry around in your head. Oh, I know this, 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 and this. It was life-changing teaching. It was meant to be life-changing teaching. The apostles' teaching became a part of the experience of this new church. To be devoted to the apostles' teaching, which of course now is embodied in the New Testament, is to be devoted to learning the Bible, learning how God wants to change your life. There are three Hebrew words for hearing which help us to grasp the thrust of this point. I don't remember a lot of my Hebrew, but I remember this much. So the first word is just it's to listen, like you hear a word. And then another word is to listen and hear with understanding. But there's another word which means to listen, hear with understanding, and to obey. And that's what's being applied here in this passage. It's this third kind of hearing, the hearing with understanding that changes your life, which is the meaning of being devoted to the apostles' teaching. Are you devoted to the reading and the applying of God's word? to your life. And how do you express that devotion? Well, second, they were devoted to the fellowship. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. Well, the fellowship is koinonia. Now, that's an important word, and many of you have already heard that word. It's a Greek word here, and it means fellowship, the gathered community, the church. Our generation is a generation that shuns commitment. We want all the benefits, but not the responsibilities. We're afraid to publicly declare commitments. Well, why become legally married? We're living together and we're committed. I've heard that. Why bother joining a church and publicly declaring allegiance to this local expression of the wider body? I mean, we're here, aren't we? There weren't any membership roles in the early church, were there? Well, someone was counting. That's why we have numbers in the book of Acts. And there were certainly martyrs' roles in the early church. To be part of the church, to associate with the believers, often meant to be beaten, to be taken to jail, to die, to be whipped, exiled, thrown to, to lions, because they dared to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because they dared to be devoted to the fellowship. 
becoming an official member of a local church, declaring your allegiance to Jesus Christ and his church by joining the local fellowship. It was just the beginning of devotion to the fellowship, but it is one expression of being devoted to the fellowship. I read a book by Michael Griffiths, which personally challenged me at a time when my devotion to the local church was at low ebb. The book is called Cinderella with Amnesia. And in that book, he says this, any fool can stand on the sidelines and shout, but God, what God needs is people who will get into the scrum and shove. He's talking about rugby football, where at the beginning and at different times in the game, people, people just seem to huddle around and they're, they're pushing and shoving and fighting for this ball. I don't understand that game at all. It just looks brutal. But what Griffith is saying applies any fool can stand on the sidelines and shout, but what God needs is people who will get into the scrum and shove. If you're not in the scrum shoving, you're not even in the game. They were devoted to the fellowship. Are you devoted to the fellowship, to koinonia? How do you express that, that devotion have you considered officially joining this church, West Village Church, joining the committed fellowship here at West Village, declaring that you're committed to this particular church? Let me say one more thing on this topic. The time that you arrive for church on Sunday morning probably says a lot about your devotion to Koinonia. Now, this morning, you get an exception. I even forgot that this is when we're supposed to change our clocks, and I'm the one that wrote in our, our uh, general newsletter that goes to the church this week, remember that it's time to change your clocks. All right, so maybe today you, you get a, a pass on this. Or also, I can remember as a parent of young children getting into the car and one of the kids vomits. Well, you got to go back in and change everybody. Well, let's change that one. And then maybe you're getting in the car and the youngest one loads their diaper and it leaks out the sides. You need to go in, wash them up. and clean. Hey, I know life happens. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? I'm not talking about time change Sunday. I'm not talking about those kind of things. Life happens. Our setup team and worship team arrive here at 8 a.m. in the morning to start to prepare things so we can worship together. They set up and test the sound commitment, go through another practice for the worship team. They've already practiced during the week, but another practice to make sure everything's working. At 9.30, other people show up and uh, they set up the welcome table and children's ministries. And then people start to arrive. Well, some arrive at 10, some at 10.05, 10, 10.10, 10.15, 10.20. 10, Don't get me wrong. People, I'm glad you're here. No matter what time you get here, I'm really glad that you are here. But when you arrive, it says a lot about your devotion to West Village Church. Listen, like when you're buying a ticket, you buy a ticket to the symphony, the, the uh, hockey game, the uh, football game, the soccer game. I mean, do you arrive on time? Probably. Do you arrive ahead of time? Most likely. Do you arrive late? Not usually. When you have a job, and five days a week you're expected to go into work, do you arrive on time? Do you arrive ahead of time? Or are you constantly late, tardy? If you are, your job is in danger. Just think about it. A comment to mention, because I do think that when we arrive reflects our devotion to the fellowship. Third, they were devoted to the breaking of bread. So they devoted themselves to celebrating the Lord's table, what we call communion. It wasn't just another meal together, but it does seem that often they would have a meal together, and then at the end of that meal, they would move into, purposely move into a celebration of the Lord's table. Regular observance of the Lord's Supper is was a part of their life together, and it wasn't considered optional. Why? Because Jesus himself commanded us to obey him and to declare allegiance to him. He said, do this in remembrance of me. So when we participate in communion, we are obeying the Lord. 
We're saying to Jesus, I'm devoted to you. Why do we take communion together? As we participate in the Lord's Supper, we declare we are his servants, wishing to be obedient to his commands. We declare the reality of our own sin and fallenness and the glorious reality of his unsurpassed love shown to us in his death on the cross. We declare the reality of his body and our participation in that body. All of this as we take communion together, as we did last week. Fourth, they devoted themselves to prayer. Prayer is the basis of all that we do. I'm convinced that all we do as Christians and followers of Jesus and as a fellowship must be bathed in prayer. This is how we, we allow God to guide us, to encourage us, and to strengthen us. Someone has said, every church must be a praying church. And I think that's true. Our church must be a praying church. And prayer is intimate. We need time for silence so we can listen to God. Prayer is talking to God as a child is talking to a father. Prayer is also listening to hear God speaking speaking to us. God will speak while will we listen. God will speak if we're willing to listen. I read a book by Catherine Marshall called Meeting God at Every Turn. And one of the things that I found striking in Catherine Marshall's life was her prayer life, her intimacy with God, her willingness to hear his voice and even do that in the practical mundane things. So for instance, she's struggling with the difficulty of raising a teenager as a single mom because her husband, Peter Marshall, has died. And she takes it to the Lord. She's feeling helpless and frustrated. And she comes before the Lord seeking guidance. guidance. And the Lord responds to her. And we see that because she writes in her journal saying, I am to bring praise to him more. That's her son, uh, Peter John. I'm to make a date with Peter John to go over finances. And through this, he will begin to feel needed. And then she goes on talking about the things that that God has said to her in that quiet time, about practical, mundane things. The early church devoted themselves to prayer. And we see this not only in this passage, but other places in the book of Acts as well. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the Bible, learning, applying it, to the fellowship, the local church, to the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper, communion, and to prayer, conversations with God. Are you devoted? Are you devoted to these things? Are we devoted to these things? Are we willing to be devoted to them? Are we willing to be considered even a little bit crazy, a bit fanatic? Well, we read, they devoted themselves. So this is a plural passage. It's not individual. It's not only for individuals. In the larger passage of verse 42 to 47, there are 11 references to the plural. What's happening not as individuals, but the plural, together. And one of the characteristics of the early church was devotion. And I find in this church, this example of the early church, to be a challenging one. I mean, I want to be devoted in this way. I want to grow in Christ in this way. But sometimes my devotion flags. It was especially at this point, that I need to fellowship of brothers and sisters. And this can happen in our larger gathering, but I think it happens not just here, but it happens even better in smaller gatherings. Whether we call them uh, support groups, nurture groups, cell groups, or C group, I think a small group is really essential. Whether that group is one of the official groups of our church or just a group of people a group of brothers and sisters, an ad hoc group of friends who meet regularly for prayer and for Bible study and bearing one another's burdens. Such a group is essential for all of us. And when my devotion is not wearing down, I need to be there for others. Remember, the context here is Peter's sermon, and it shows that the early church was, first of all, devoted to Jesus. They were devoted to walking in repentance and faith in following Jesus. So we say first, the early church was on the growing edge with devotion. And second, the early church was on the growing edge with reverence, verse 43. So this is the second characteristic 
of the first church, it's reverence. 43, verse 43 says, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. The Greek word here is fear, which is translated awe. Now, if you have an ESV Bible, there's a little note there. You look at the bottom, and it says fear. And so it is. So although the word awe actually is a very appropriate translation here, as you're going to see very soon, there are at least four main categories of fear in the Bible. And I think it's really important to understand this, not only for this passage, but for other passages that talk about the fear of the Lord. So one type of fear is fear, like as the object of fear, fear in and of itself. And as the people of Israel were about to enter the promised land, we read in Exodus 23 that God would send his fear ahead of them, throwing every nation into confusion. So this is fear as an object, a thing in and of itself. And this type of fear is described in the saying, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Another type of fear, second type of fear is the fear of men. And this is sometimes in the form of reverential awe for one who is in higher social status, like a slave for a master. And sometimes it's blind dread. Proverbs 29, 25 states, fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. And there's a third type of fear, which is a slavish fear. This is a shaking in your boots kind of fear. It's the kind of fear that causes a person to cower. It is the kind of fear that Adam expressed in the Garden of Eden after disobeying God. When Adam said to God, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. For I was naked, so I hid myself. Genesis 3, 10. So there are these kinds of fear. It's the fear of man and the slavish fear which are cast out by that perfect love mentioned in 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect fear casts out, perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So this is talking about the fear of man and talking about that slavish fear dreading kind of fear. But there is another kind of fear. And in Acts 2.43, it's this different kind of fear. The fourth kind of fear is a holy fear. The holy fear comes from the believer's understanding of the living God. An understanding of God in his majesty and his holiness. Holy fear is awe. It's reverence. For God. And that's why the translation awe is a good translation in our Bibles. Isaiah had a vision of God in his holiness. Recorded in Isaiah 6, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the seraphim angels stood around crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The vision made Isaiah realize his own sinfulness and separateness from God. But his sin is forgiven, leaving him a position to go in response to God's command. This is the kind of fear that I'm talking about here. Ah. In his holiness, God is separate. Separate from his creation, existing apart from creation, not dependent on his creation, separate from sin. He's perfect without sin. But we, we miss the mark when we sin. And, and God is the one who sets the mark, no matter how you're talking about it. And we don't hit that mark. God in his love reaches out to us in Jesus Christ, who died for our sins because we were unable to reach him. So he reaches out to us. God's love is holy love. He acknowledges his separateness, his perfection, and our sinfulness. God's holy love is love. He reaches out to us and forgives our sin, our wrongdoing, not because we deserve his attention, but because he loves us. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, 
that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but of everlasting life. John 3, 16. Holy love. Everything associated with God is holy. If we're God's people, we're called to holiness, called to reflect his holy character. I want to explain this a little further, but I, I want to remember two verbs as I say this. Declared and transformed. Declared, transformed. I want you to say that out loud to help you remember. Say it with me. Declared, transformed. Okay, now this time you're ready. Declared, transformed. All right. Declared, transformed. In Jesus Christ, we first of all declared holy. As a result of Christ's redemptive work on the cross, all believers are declared holy, righteous. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what he does, 1 John 1, 9. The New Testament word for Christians is saints, meaning holy ones. If you're a believer in Jesus, you are a saint, a holy one. When did you last think of that? You mean you're sitting, you're probably sitting beside a saint. You're in a group of holy ones. That's the way the New Testament talks about Christians. Now, often we, we say to ourselves, well, I'm a sinner saved by grace. At its best, that means emphasizing grace, but I, I often feel it's emphasizing sinners. The New Testament never calls believers sinners saved by grace. That might be a reality. It is a reality, but it's not our title. It's not our designation in the New Testament. The New Testament always refers to believers as saints, holy ones. We are declared holy, and we are being transformed into holiness. Okay, you need to get this. In God's judgment through Jesus, we are declared holy through his death on the cross. Jesus took our judgment that we deserve on himself, so we are declared holy. In the reality of our everyday life, we are being transformed by the Holy Spirit from imperfection to perfection, from sin to sinlessness, and it's a process called growing in Christ. Sanctification, a process that will never be complete this side of heaven. We're called to holiness, declared holiness, being transformed in our everyday life to be holy, to be more like Jesus. After a particularly successful meeting, Billy Graham, the, the evangelist, was asked, is this revival? And Graham replied, no, when revival comes, I expect to see two things that I have not seen yet. First, a new sense of holiness on the part of Christians and a new sense of the sinfulness of sin. Characteristic of the first church is reverence, and for good reason. They are under conviction of sin before a holy God through Peter's sermon and the apostles' teaching. But it's that conviction that leads them to experience the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and to worship and praise the awesome, holy God. They saw God in his holiness and majesty, and they worshiped him. The early church was on the growing edge with devotion. The early church was on the growing edge with reverence. And third, the early church was on the growing edge with togetherness. Let's look at verse 44. 44 to 47. And all who believed were together and had things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. A third characteristic of the early church is togetherness. Now, we touched on this a little earlier when we looked at devotion to the fellowship, the fellowship being koinonia. In this passage, we see the church is indeed plural. Remember, 11 references to the plural in these few verses. This togetherness involved all believers. There are at least some people, I mean, perhaps many people, who would ask this question, well, can I be a Christian without going to church and joining 
the church? Well, I recently read this intriguing response, and I want to share it with you. Well, yes, it is possible. It's something like being a student who doesn't go to school, a soldier who will not join the army, a citizen who won't pay taxes or vote, a salesman with no customers, a businessman on a deserted island, an author without readers, a tuba player without an orchestra, a parent without a family, a football player without a team, a politician who is a hermit, a scientist who doesn't share his findings. It's like a bee without a hive. Togetherness involves all the believers. They devoted themselves, devoted themselves to the koinonia, to the fellowship. So here are the essentials of koinonia. So if we're going to experience biblical koinonia, we need to have these four things together. And any time the word is used throughout the New Testament, it will certainly mean at least these four basic things. One, we must love God with our total beings. Two, we must submit to God's sovereign rule. Three, we must experience God in a real and personal way. And four, we must trust God completely. So whenever we say the word koinonia in the New Testament, and whenever we want to, to apply that to ourselves, as we must, it's these four things that are an important part of koinonia. I, I admit we do not often do these things perfectly. In fact, we usually do them imperfectly. But they're still the basis for a true biblical koinonia. And so to this list of essentials, we can add the characteristics of togetherness underlined in our passage. So here they are. First, togetherness involves generosity, so stewardship, sharing. The believers had an intense feeling of responsibility for one another and, and a, a wonderful abandon toward their material possessions. They were willing to sell everything they had to help their new brothers and sisters and to help the fellowship. But as the story of Acts continues, the act of communal pooling and communal living does not seem to characterize other churches formed outside or beyond Jerusalem. So the question always comes up, well, it's, should we do this in our churches? Shouldn't we be doing this? Well, our passage describes what's happening. It doesn't mean it's prescriptive. It's descriptive. So the principles continue to apply to us. But even given that, what we see is that as the book of Acts continues on, then in other places, it's not mentioned that they're selling everything and sharing everything in common. But the sense of responsibility for one another and the abandon toward material possessions, the generosity is taught throughout the New Testament. I remember talking to a fellow student when I went to Regent College, which is a theological college in Vancouver. And we were having coffee together. And he, he, he had just arrived fairly recently. And he said to me, everything I hear here, they seem to be telling me I'm supposed to make money to give it away. And I thought, okay, now you're starting to get the point. That's right. All your money, if you belong to Jesus, all your money, everything belongs to Jesus. Well, second, their togetherness involves worship. They met in the temple courts for public worship and witness. They met in various homes for fellowship, a fellowship meal and celebration of the Lord's celebrating the Lord's Supper. And in their worship, they showed like a gladness, a, a sincerity, um, a singleness of heart, celebration. Togetherness is the super glue, the crazy glue that binds us together. It's meant to include all believers. It involves stewardship, sharing, generosity. It involves worshiping together. This is not something we can do from a distance. All right, we did it during COVID, and Zoom was better than nothing. But what a blessing to be back together again every Sunday. This kind of togetherness can only happen when we are, well, in fact, together. And this is why it is essential to have times, whether we call them fellowship times or togetherness times, just when we're rubbing shoulders, when we're, we have close proximity some of this happens on Sunday morning, but I firmly believe that for this to be a characteristic of our church, we need times other than Sunday morning 
that we are together. Fourth, the early church was on the growing edge with, well, growth. That's what it says. Devotion, reverence, togetherness, growth. The fourth characteristic of the first church is growth. Verse 47, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Four characteristics of the early church. Devotion, reverence, togetherness, and growth. In some circles, there, is, there seems to be a resistance toward talking about church growth. But to ignore church growth is to ignore one of the important characteristics of the early church. As the gospel exploded beyond Jerusalem, and in fact, it reached out to all the Roman Empire, even to Rome itself, and probably right through to Spain in one generation, and maybe further than what we even know. Growth happened. The church grew. Well, church growth needs to be both quantitative and Qualitative. So quantitative growth involves numerical growth, adding people to the church, added those who were being saved. And, of course, the multiplication of congregations was happening as well. That's church planting. Qualitative growth involves perfecting the church, making disciples, maturing Christ. It involves growing in love and interpersonal relationships growing and discovering and using gifts of the Spirit in the context of the body, growing in holiness and beauty of lifestyle, growing in worship and knowledge of God, growing in congregational impact upon the surrounding community, growing in training teachers and leaders and sending out missionaries, all of those things. In short, these two types of growth mean being and becoming a healthy church. Both quantitative and qualitative growth are essential to the local church. They're essential to our church as well. And the growth which is depicted in verse 47 is characteristic of this church, this early church, and it is numerical growth. The church did not only grow in maturity, it did that, but it also grew in numbers as the Lord added to their number. Well, those who added, who were added were being saved. And were added. So the church was active in evangelism and in reaching out and sharing their faith with people around them wherever they went. And the church itself was a believer's church. Those being added who were joining were believers. God has no grandchildren. It's important to note that the Lord added. We exert effort in this matter of church growth, but it must be the Lord who works in and through us, guiding us, leading us, making us effective. In fact, God is already at work around us, and we need to look for his activity, and that's what we are doing, is looking for his activity, and we want to join him in what he is doing. And we, as we do these, these characteristics that I've just been talking about in the early church, well, they'll become our characteristics more and more. In many ways, they are our characteristics, but to become our correct characteristics more and more. We will become more and more a healthy, growing church. Is that what you want? I think that's exactly what you want. A church of devotion, reverence, togetherness, and growth. It's my vision for this church. My prayers be a vision that you have, all of you, that this is the kind of church we continue to be and grow to be more and more. Let's pray. Father God, we acknowledge that what was happening here in this early church wasn't just a matter of their own efforts, but it's something that you were doing there in that church. Something that started with the coming of the Holy Spirit and Peter preaching the sermon that he did. And then people responding to your work in their life, responding to the Holy Spirit in their life. We acknowledge that. It's a work that you need to do. And we give you thanks. That that's the work that you have been doing in our church, West Village Church. That you've given the Spirit, and the Spirit works among us. 
But Lord God, we want more. We want to be a healthy, growing church, serving, loving our Lord Jesus Christ, each other, and the world around us. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Brian. If you're able to, would you stand with us again and let's respond in song together. In the darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt to 
the King of kings, we sing praise forever to the King of kings. can take your seat. I have a couple of announcements I want to leave with you. West Village Kids Family Easter Craft Night coming up on Friday, March 22nd, 6 p.m. at the church office. You can register on the events page on our website. Good Friday is quickly coming. We'll have a Good Friday service meeting here at 10 a.m. It'll be a family service. The children will be with us. A little shorter, a little more manageable for them, but it'll be family service, all of us together. An Easter Sunday morning, at 10 a.m., we'll have um, March 31st. It's in March this year. We'll have a family service together. And just to say it's a great time to invite friends and family um, to come along with you. If you would like to talk to me about things I've been talking about, or if you like prayer, I'd be very happy to pray for you. I'll stay at the front here for a few minutes, and you can come and see me. Go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the love of the Father and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.